scriptural selections this morning are from the books of Romans and the book of Luke. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the re revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but for the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its enslavement to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning together as it suffers together the pains of labor. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption. The redemption of our bodies, for in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what one already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. In those days, a decree went out from Augustus, uh, Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went out to their own towns to be registered. Word of God for the people of God. Todd, are you more relaxed this Sunday? Does it feel like a Sunday off for you after last week? Thank you for preaching last week. You did very well too. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you for preaching last week. Friends, please join me in a posture of prayer. Oh God, from the beginning you have called your people to undertake a journey in faith. As we begin Advent, guide us to you through our readings, reflections, messages, and worship, through fellowship, speaking, listening, and through the presence of your Holy Spirit. May our time together today be a journey that brings us closer to Jesus Christ, whose first coming we celebrate, whose future we await, and who promises to take us on a journey that will not end, even in death. Amen. Friends, we are so often focused on the destination in our travels, that where are you going is the most common question upon hearing that someone is heading out of town. Where are you going? While the destination is perhaps the reason for deciding to go, it's often the journey itself that offers the most memorable moments, whether frustrating or delightful. This Advent season will pay attention not just to the destination of Christmas, but also to the places where events occurred that led to the starry night in which a child was born who would change the world. And we'll ponder our own milestones, the progress and the potholes on the way. So I want you to think of the biggest trip you've ever taken. Where did you go and why? What advanced preparations did you make and were they enough? What were the most surprising, memorable, or challenging things about your journey? And how, if at all, are you different because of your journey? Friends, these next few weeks will be a scriptural and spiritual journey to destinations associated with the Christmas story. Rome, Jerusalem, Nazareth, and Bethlehem. As I said earlier in our service, we begin our Advent journey towards Bethlehem in the manger, with a decree from Rome. Needing more money to build the Roman Empire, Caesar Augustus demands a census so that all who lived under his reign could contribute to his expansion of power. Whether we're, fan, we're a fan of those in power or not, our lives and stories are often shaped by that which is out of our immediate control. And this was true in the moment of the Roman decree that would turn into a story of hope for the world. In this first week of Advent, we ask ourselves whether we're placing our hope in the empires of the world or in God's presence. What are we longing for this Advent, and how does it call us to act in hope? So in the Gospel of Luke, Luke carefully introduces the historical setting of Jesus' birth. 
At the time of Jesus' birth, Herod the Great was the king of Judea, and Caesar Augustus was the emperor of Rome. Luke wants us to bear in mind the socio-political climate that Jesus was born into. My grandparents shared with me some of their life experiences, and some of the bigger things were the Great Depression, World War II, the killing of JFK Jr. And I think all of us can share stories about the cultural, social, and political events that happened during our birth and our childhood. Again, this is Luke's intent concerning the cultural, social, and political climate surrounding Jesus' birth. And as Todd read this morning, a decree was sent out by Caesar Augustus. Now, decrees were considered unchangeable laws that everyone had to obey, and the importance of it was similar to the Constitution of the United States. Whenever the emperor made a command, citizens of Rome followed the command without questioning it, because decrees were foundational laws. And typically, laws were created for military or monetary reasons. But this decree that Caesar Augustus enforced was for taxation. He wanted to know how many people he could tax, and the only way to tax people was to have them volunteer to be registered. Now, Caesar Augustus was a title that was given to the person who ruled Rome. The word Caesar means emperor, while Augustus means highly esteemed. So Gaius Octavian is the person that's mentioned in our text this morning, according to verse 1. Octavian was inaugurated as Caesar Augustus in the year 44 BC until 14 AD, which means he was in power while Jesus was a baby in much of his youth. Now Octavian was an intelligent man. He advanced engineering projects like temples and roads, and those same roads were used by the apostles to further the gospel. And the majority of these ruins still exist today. He was one of the most prominent figures in Roman history. Rome was the center of the major empire, and it spread advancements in construction and social services also. And although the Pax Romana started under Augustus, that brought about unprecedented peace and prosperity to Roman citizens, the experience of occupied lands like Israel was quite different. The empire showed little sensitivity to Jewish religious customs. Friends, the Roman Empire had the power to do good things, but not everything about Roman occupation was good. As those living in a conquered and occupied land, Jewish people in Jesus' day were treated as second-class citizens. No voice, no vote. Have you ever felt like a second-class citizen? What groups of people in the United States today are treated as second-class citizens or as non-citizens? Sometimes places much farther away, places of power, determine what happens in a town like Bethlehem. And the same was true at the birth of Jesus. The place of power that determined the atmosphere of Bethlehem at the time of Jesus' birth was Rome. It shaped culture, laws, and beliefs of people. So what represents Rome for you? In the U.S., this might be Washington, D.C., or the state capital or your county seat. Rome is where decisions were made that impact your life beyond your control. Healthcare coverage, access to public services, even the condition of your neighborhood. Some of us live in Rome. We're in positions to make decisions that affect people far from us, and we must keep their needs in mind. We all, we all live affected by the Romes of our world, we're all impacted by events that are beyond our control. And sometimes the impact is minimal and at other times deep and painful. Think of Ukrainian mothers trying to keep their children safe. Think of families facing evictions because a property management company in a faraway city increases their rent. Did someone you know lose a job because of a decision reached at a company headquarters? Rome is a place where a stroke of a pen a vote or an idea can launch ripples that become crashing waves on our doorsteps. Has there ever been a place in your life affected by some decree in Rome where decisions made far away had huge ramifications for you? Rome reminds us of the Israelites. They lived under an occupying force beyond their control. They longed for more. They longed for freedom. They longed for justice. They longed for peace. But changing the way of things seems impossible, and all they could really do is long for something better. And beloved, this is where Advent begins, in longing. The way to Christmas starts in Rome, 
the seat of power, where our hopes and fears are released and sometimes they collide. The journey to Christmas is longing, but not little longings, not like New Year's Eve and a goal of losing 10 pounds. The longings of Advent are deeper and more spiritual. So what longings do you bring to Advent? This is a good question to spend some time considering. Is there a longing to find a mate? To fill a void caused by loneliness? Have you longed to be reunited with a loved one? Now the other side of this question is to consider the longings of God. What does God long for the world? Now this question can radically change the direction of our lives because when our heart breaks over the things that break God's heart, God may call us to be the solution to those problems. Maybe your heart's disturbed by the lack of peace in the world. Gun violence, adequate health care, are the changes to our climate. But let's return to the Christmas story. Long before text messaging, a decree made in Rome could have taken months or a year to be carried thousands of miles. So Caesar Augustus's decree came way before the angel visited Mary. Because the story does indeed begin in Rome. The journey to Christmas starts with God acting through worldly and political events for the purpose of allowing Jesus to be born in a manger in Bethlehem. What happened in Bethlehem started in Rome. What does that mean for you to begin your journey to Christmas in Rome? Where do you see evidence of God's work in the world? Where can you see God clearly moving? Even in times of turmoil, when God seemed or seems absent, events unfolded which God used to further God's purpose. And I believe Luke brings the Christmas story to Rome because we're all affected by Rome's. Rome makes this Christmas story more than just a sweet and tender story, but also to show the real challenges of our world. Beginning Christmas in Rome means God dominates the scene there as much as in the stable. God reigns over our presidents. God inhabits the halls of capitals. No one on earth would have looked at Caesar's decree and immediately thought God is up to something. But I imagine the angels in heaven saying, get ready. There is a longing generated by the realms of the world. We long for peace, unity, greater compassion among people, and an end to violence and division. Christ meets us in the chaos and the fear. He meets us in the place where we feel helpless to know how to help others. He meets us when we get weary of the world and we crawl into bed and we pull that pillow over our head. He meets us in our deepest longings. But sometimes we have to go looking. We have to seek. Because when we open ourselves to the possibility of God showing up, he tells us, I am here. I am working. There is a reason to hope. Friends, without Rome, it's unlikely that Jesus would have been born in Bethlehem. God is still in charge, even in our Romes. Please join me in prayer. Sovereign God, empires rise and fall, but your good purposes remain. As you called your saints in the past to challenge the powers of this world with the power of your justice and love, so you call us. We know we cannot change this world on our own. We also know we cannot change it without you. In Jesus Christ, you reveal your will and join us to him so we may participate in bringing it about. This Advent season, grant us courage and the trust to do so. <coughs> Amen.